Altså så er PhD, du kan det der ting, når du så til en egen lænder. Altså så kan, når de læser, når de læser mig sødt, så er det så til, der er selv og slå med, der er mange på gata sødt, til at slå kunne gøre på sig, i ligesom at du er nær slå ned, i slags søgen om mål. Der er der, Rilla nak på godt, i ligesom at du er nær slå ned, i slags søgen i sig, hvis jeg er nær i sig, hvis jeg er nær i sig, Ilta suin nissa mut nali lisak tut. Si oli tasuat professor Morten Melko manna okasakas saak. Kære Ph.D. kandidat Ejn Eileen Lennart. Kære bedømmelsesudvalg. Kære vejleder og kære alle. Jeg vil byde alle velkommen til denne forsvarshandling. Vi ser frem til en spændende forsvar. Og jeg vil straks give ordet til formanden for bedømmelsesudvalget, professor Morten Melgaard, der gænder. Ja, yeah, and to make things uh, more complicated, I will speak in English. <laughs> I hope you bear over with me but uh, our primary opponent is uh, from America and we need to be in it together, all of us, and you have written it in English also, so that's why. Thank you, Gitte, uh, for your welcome. Um, my name is Morten, as Gitte said, and uh, I'm a professor at the university in Copenhagen, but I'm also affiliated professor here at uh, Elisabeth Dusafik. And um, normally uh, it would be the leader of the PhD school, which is created here in Lisbeth Dusafik, that would stand in my place here, Anna Meryl, but uh, she was not, it wasn't possible for her to be here today, and so I uh, take the place and uh, oversee the, the defense. Um, and Eileen has submitted her thesis, A Millennium of Changing Environments in the God of Shore, West Greenland, Bridging Cultures of Knowledge. This is the one, and it has been out there for some time, and uh, people who have wanted to read it have had the opportunity to do so. Um, according to uh, the uh, rules of the PhD defense, and in order for you to, to uh, attain it, um, Uh, the um, author has given the opportunity to present her work here and uh, defend the thesis in the presence of the evaluation committee. Uh, and the evaluation committee consists of uh, Tom McGovern, who's sitting there, and who is from Hunter College, City University of New York, and who actually knows Greenland very well and has been working in the fjords of, uh, the fj uh, of Nuuk here for well, at least uh, since 1976, and uh, on and off since then. Um, and then Susan, Professor Susan Crate from the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at George, George Mason University. But uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, she had to uh, and could not uh, attend the Skype meeting which we had uh, agreed on. Uh, so unfortunately, she's not present, neither uh, in the air or uh, in physical presence. But I'm here and I'm, uh, as I said, professor and I represent sort of the home institution um, as chairman of the evaluation committee. And um, also I think we should acknowledge Naya Mikkelsen who is uh, uh, one of the uh, supervisors. Uh, Mark Noddle, uh, who was a primary supervisor Uh, was not able to uh, attend the meeting because he, his family, there were some family illness problems, and but Naya was fortunately able to come here, and we are happy to have you here. Um, the defense uh, will uh, proceed as follows. Uh, I will read aloud the conclusions that Tom and I and Susan uh, came upon reading the, the uh, thesis, and then you will give a presentation of your work uh, for an hour or so, and then Tom will uh, present uh, and discuss with you uh, the theses and issues which he finds interesting, and uh, then we'll have a short break. And um, uh, it, the reason for this break is 
both for you to go to the toilet and whatever, but also for if somebody has to go before the rest of the defense. But uh, mainly because if there is somebody here who wants to pose a question or discuss something of Anne's thesis, you know, so-called ex auditorio, you are welcome to come and tell me, and uh, I'll put you on the list. Anyway, when we've had this small pause, um, I will uh, have some questions and. Uh, I'll sort of round off the uh, the um, the discussions, and then um, the candidate, you, and uh, the rest of the auditorium will retreat to the Pentaopticon, uh, and Tom and I we will sit back here and we will vote together uh, on uh, the uh, what what uh, what should come out of it, and uh, when once we've decided, uh, we'll come out and give you a vote. And then what happens is that the uh, the vote goes on to the uh, acad academic council in in the university, and they finally decide, you know, to pass the PhD degree uh, on. So uh, and and so on. So that's sort of the formal procedure. Altogether, we shouldn't be here for more than three hours. <laughs> so, uh, and I think we we probably uh, will not use all the time, but. Uh, the defense will be live streamed, um, and it's probably going on right now, I think. And um, as I said uh, in the beginning, the language will be English, but Gide and I, we can take questions in Greenlandic and in Danish and translate them uh, to Anne, and uh, she can answer in English so that Tom can still follow everything, even though you do know some Danish and maybe even some Greenlandic. Um, Yes, and then finally, there's an, a reception uh, in the uh, Panopticon, which is hosted by the Nature Institute, Pingotit de Laifik, and the university here in Unison. And um, I should also say that the, this defense is a, the first defense within the sort of the climate center, uh, and uh, which is a center which is connecting the university with the Nature Institute. And so, in many ways, it's a really nice situation that you are able now to present the results of, of your work within this framework. So, um, with this, I would go on to read the uh, sort of the conclusions of the, um, the pre preliminary evaluation. And the, it sounds a little strange that it's a preliminary evaluation, but that's, of course, because you also have this uh, oral presentation, which will be part of the final evaluation. And then it will be the final evaluation. So now I will just read the conclusions, and uh, so you uh, you can see that things are actually okay. <laughs> the overall product of the thesis is the creation of a framework for ongoing dialogue among scientists, resource managers, hunters, and knowledge bearers of all sorts. The connection of stories to place and the integration of archaeology, geology, animal behavior, oceanography, and climate science is well handled and represents a real contribution to knowledge in several interrelated fields, as well as developing a practical framework for co-production of knowledge. Additionally, the mixed methodology, mixed data approach, where the author is expanding on traditional data sets, makes a much needed contribution to interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity the latter included to emphasize engaging stakeholders. Or how we effect effectively integrate quantitative and qualitative information. Along those same lines, not only do we need to supplement instrumental data to create a picture of the historical past, we need to supplement quantitative data to tell how specific ecosystems and cultures of place are affected. The papers are well written and produced nice use of graphics, and the, each explores a different aspect of co-production of knowledge. The participatory, participatory mapping paper is closest to con conventional ethnography, while papers 5, 7, and 8 are more biologically oriented and emphasize the value of dialogue between oceanographers, climatologists, resource managers, and local residents whose observations and daily experience add a great deal to the understanding of shifting animal populations and unexpected interactions between high Arctic and low Arctic species as orcas move north. Paper 3 is a very nice integration of participatory mapping 
and conventional archaeology survey and the cross fertilization of the dialogue in this case seems particularly productive. Due to the nature of the thesis, and you probably have seen all that there are eight papers uh, in the thesis bound together by an introduction and a conclusion. Um, but anyway, due to the nature of the thesis, uh, there's a bit of repetition in the introductions of the paper where the approach and its value are discussed. But this is an unavoidable result of the overall format and not a significant issue. The introduction and conclusion sections do a nice job of pulling the papers together and providing an overview. The thesis has many strengths in both broad conceptualization and specific details. At least four of the articles constitute strong standalone cases and the, the others make important conceptual points. All combine to provide a very strong case for better integration of Greenlandic LTK and with global change science and resource management in a rapidly changing Arctic. It points the way forward for practical applications of participatory mapping and engagement of experienced hunters and other knowledge holders in the full co-production of knowledge for better global response to change. A solid contribution to a growing literature and a fine product of Greenland scholar, Greenlandic scholarship. There are no major weak points in the thesis that might prevent its successful defense, but a few comments and suggestions might be helpful. Both outside reviewers, note, both outside reviewers noted that the format of the thesis with many articles, multiple articles and introduction and conclusion results in a certain amount of repetition as a basic argument for the value of LTK and co-production tends to be get rehearsed in each piece. This is, of course, simply a reflection of the multiple articles approach to the doctorate, and it is not within the control of the author. It won't be too long before I'm through. Uh, one area that might repay a bit more attention would be a wider discussion of other groups' application of map-based interface approaches for discussing and recording LTK. Here, the ELOCA program, which is mentioned in the text, has been a leader. And it might be worth adding a paragraph or so how this research may relate to the program or other efforts to use map-based interfaces for similar ends. It seems likely that Anne may be moving further in this direction anyway, so just a bit more here may be useful later on. This is clearly, and this is the future work, this is clearly a rich and a multifaceted study, but one data set that might prove really useful and interesting to use in the future are the old hunting statistic catch records maintained for small communities all around Greenland, listing landing by species and sometimes by season as well. These were a key data for uh, source for Vibes' important work and McGovern found them really useful in trying to understand marine mammal dynamics and the differences between Norse and recent Greenlandic hunting patterns. These could be mapped out if it hasn't already happened, and informants could have probably add a huge amount of insight if they could look through them with you. Something for the next article, maybe. Recommendation. It is a fine and credible piece of work that makes genuine contributions to knowledge and points the way forward towards more effective transdisciplinary research and cross-cultural communication. It certainly re represents a fully acceptable doctoral thesis. Clear pass. Well done. So. And you're not supposed to clap. <laughs> not clapping, not yet. <laughs> that's, the, that's sort of the normal thing. In the end, we'll clap. <laughs> OK, and, and now, uh, thank you for your patience. And uh, now we will uh, go on to hear Anne's presentation of the, of the paper. Thank you. Can you hear me well enough? I'll close this down. So today I'm going to present how one can deepen one's knowledge through collaborations across communities and disciplines, and when combined that they actually can reveal really interesting things. And my presentation today is a cross cut of all the eight articles that I have in this uh, thesis here, including them all, of course. Um, and what I've actually been doing here through my work, three years of work, is actually really nicely you know, visualized here on the front page of my um, uh, the front page of my thesis. It actually shows how I have been layering the different types of knowledge. How knowledge is like a history. It can be like here we have oi, 
um, like an archaeological midden. And a midden is the waste that people throw. And it's actually a storyline. So we have the button lay here, and then you move all the way up through history. And the knowledge which I have gathered can then be put into this storyline and contributing to knowledge and uh, of the eco history of the fjord, but also maybe giving an, an idea of uh, future scenarios too. And my work actually began uh, when I was given this map here. And actually I was given this map in relation to looking at the Norse uh, settlements in the fjord. And the Norse, they are all these small points here. And especially these in the inner part were the ones that I was really interested in. But then taking another look at this uh, uh, map, I actually realized that it also showed a lot of other things. It showed how the ice margins here were here all the way out here in winter. And this map is from 1907, and it was Daniel Brun who made this map. Another really fascinating thing about this map was that it was also showing what different animals there were in the fjord, where there are narwhals, where they would catch seals. So this map was actually a co-production of knowledge he had gathered from the hunters around the, the knowledge he had been shared from them. Um, and this fjord is really, really unique because it has really a immense history of cultures moving in and out of the fjord. We have the Sakka culture, which you can see there. We have the Dorset, which you can see when the tide is low. Then we have the Thule, and then we have, of course, the colonization um, of Greenland, too, in the area. But the fjord also show has a, another history. First of all, it's the largest fjord in southwest Greenland. But it's also really a unique example of how glaciers have carved the landscape. So when we sail out on the fjord, we can see these beautiful mountains. This is actually the glaciers which have carved their way through the landscapes, giving us this fantastic scenery when sailing around. And it also sh has a history of environments that are in constant change. So in seasons, the fjord have been covered in ice. And seasons have been changing constantly. Sometimes the ice has been there longer, sometimes shorter. Sometimes it has been warm or cold. And all these things, they alter and shape the environment and also the eco-history of the fjord, but also how people have been living and moving in this area. And looking at uh, the environments is actually really a complex system. Looking at the food web here, you can see that you, how everything is interconnected. So we have the ice algae being eaten by the zooplankton and those being eaten by the cod, then then are eaten by seals, then polar bears, and humans too. So it's a really, really complex system. And if one of these species are taken out, or if some move north because the water gets warm, the whole ecosystem changes. Um, but it's also an interaction of many other things. It can be the atmosphere, the wind, the humidity, the, wind, uh, the weather, um, or it can be the ice, of course. Um, and all these things alter how also people have been living, their social frames, the economy, their interactions with their environments. So in that way, taking that in reverse, one can use these things, this knowledge of people, how they have been moving around also to get an idea of how environments have been in the past. So nature is really complex. It's an act uh, and interaction between a web of elements. And therefore, it's really important to look at a whole spectra of interrelated fields. Because some of them are obvious, but there are also some who actually surprise in their relevance when trying to understand variations uh, in the fjord systems and environmental that's the environments that are changing, too. And that's why. In my work, I've tried or been working with bridging cultures of knowledge in that way to try and find ways to prolong time series or alternative ways to in, uh, understand environmental variations or alternative ways to use the past and maybe get a hint and understanding of the future. And by this also prolonging uh, longer historical baselines than instrumental uh, measurements but also additionally validating models used for future predictions. The longer time series we have, the better we can make our predictions of the future too. So what I've been working with is bridging science and knowledge, of course, and that's been looking at marine geology and biology, oceanography, glaciology, archeology, span 
traditional knowledge, cultural landscapes, and archives. And today, I will focus on knowledge. What is knowledge? And the things that use knowledge here, traditional knowledge, the cultural landscapes, and the archives. The knowledge that is not science in the same sense as the ones above. And actually, when gathering knowledge, like local knowledge and traditional knowledge, there are different ways of doing that. And when I've been doing that, I've been doing it by listening. It's really, really important to listen. It's like lying in bed, being told a bed-night story from one's grandparents and just closing down. But it's also important to listen to nature, too. It has been traveling. It's really important to travel. It's by traveling that you move through a history of life, through features and place names that are like chapters in a book that tell a story of environments evolving in front of you. Conversations, not interviews. It's important to have conversations with people where they can reflect over things or maybe tell something that might, be not, might not be of importance but later on actually beca can become really, really relevant. And then it's really important uh, to share knowledge, a process of sharing knowledge where you learn something and also give of what you know. And this way, by discussing the things that you see, the things that you hear, is a really good way of collating knowledge. And having time. Because gathering knowledge takes a lot of time. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges when co collating natural science and social sciences or traditional and local knowledge. That's the time that makes it difficult. But gathering all these knowledges does that I can assemble a lot of knowledge. And then it helps me that this ad assembled knowledge, I can pick out different elements that might actually help my study or actually shape the way or the way forward to what I have to study. So in that way, it, it's a layer of knowledge which can be used in diverse ways. So, but what is knowledge actually? Well, knowledge in general is built from a certain type of awareness or an understanding of something or someone. And it can be built on facts, information, descriptions, skills, a sense of locality. And it can be acquired through experience, narratives, and education. And the very unique thing also with knowledge is that it's local oriented. So knowledge is built on an interest and a relation of a specific area uh, or a topic and also that it produces and reproduces the sense of locality, a relation to an area too. So, what knowledge have I actually been using? Well, first of all, I've been using local and traditional knowledge. And this knowledge in the beginning of my work, I didn't really think so much about, but I was introduced to this knowledge working with the uh, Nuuk Monitoring and Mapping Project together with Lene and the fantastic hunters sitting back there, Vitus and Angungwak. And they really introduced me to a knowledge that I hadn't thought about. They could tell, they have the knowledge from their own life experience, from moving around in this area for years and days and through a whole lifetime. But they also have the knowledge that they have been taught by their parents and their grandparents and the knowledge which is embedded in the environments. And actually, they are the true natural historians of this area and really, really important. And how can one use traditional and, uh, knowledge and natural science? So what is the difference? Well, actually, I don't think there's so much difference because these two knowledges both use a rational and intuitive and logical thinking. It, they both are systematic, they use systematic and empirical approaches and experimental-like processes, so you try things out. And they're also both an intellectual process where they observe, infer, and predict, and they are dynamic in their uh, evolution. But they also both transfer knowledge so natural scientists would transfer knowledge through their publications and local traditional knowledge is passed through generations through narratives, cultural landscapes, 
practice and experience. And traveling around with local hunters can tell a lot of different things. It's through stories that they come and sp suddenly speak of ice. And their knowledge of how the texture is, the sound, how does it sound when it breaks up, the distribution and ice patterns could be a really good knowledge for natural science. Or the sea, how the sea level has changed, the island that got smaller, or the bottom topography of an area, or the color, um, or how the seal floats. Or they can tell stories of how my animals migrate, their abundance, their behavior, disturbances, which is really, um, maybe can be important in relation to contaminants and stress factors too, and how food webs interact. And they can tell stories of glaciers, the size of the calving ice, the way that they carve, the retreat, underwater plume, a lot of different things that one can pick out and use for one's work. And there's also another knowledge which one can call the local knowledge, and that's when human curiosity becomes to science. It can be like Guluk here on the picture, studying a cable in while Ada is telling her about this animal, which awakens a curiosity in her that might follow her through life and giving her a knowledge that she can use later on. Or it can be as Samuel Kleinschmidt, who was a German Moravian, uh, Moravian uh, missionary and a linguist, who was really interested in the weather, uh, the wind patterns, temperatures, and suddenly his curiosity turned into science, which I'll get back to later on. But science can also become human, and that's when we communicate knowledge. When science communicates knowledge, this can be through like a children's book I'm doing now based on my PhD, or it can just be scientists doing it in general. But this, uh, when science becomes human, is also a way to kindle the curiosity of people so that they may be also be interested in science in the future, too. There's also other types of knowledge, and these are the archives, and they have a lot of information. It can be diaries, which describes different patterns of ice, the weather, animals, what they've been experiencing day in and day out. It can be reports and observations as this one with the whales. You see here the beluga whales. Um, how, how many they have caught? This is number six. No, it's beluga whales, it's bowhead whales. Number six, seven, and eight here they have caught here. Or it can be a Simon Kleinsmith who then had um, a meteorological station built in uh, Kronok, and then where there was a young man writing down different things as temperature and weather, but he also wrote a lot of observations about ice, which one also can use. It can be logbooks from ships. It can be trade lists that tell what animals have been caught where and when and how many. And these also tell information of how the animals look, their size, and where they have been caught. It can be through aerial photography, like this one. These were taken in the beginning of the 1930s, um, and these can actually be really important tool also to look at glaciers um, and how they move. and retreat back and forth, and old maps, of course. And here we have Daniel Brun again, his fantastic map collating different knowledges, both the traditional knowledge, the knowledge observed, and these things can really come with important information. And one of the really good things about being here is that we have the archives just downstairs, and it has immense amount of knowledge, local knowledge of the environments in Greenland. But knowledge can also be found in the cultural landscapes. And these can be the cultures living in these areas. We have the Norse entering the fjord in a warm period and settling here in these beautiful green areas and also here along in the inner part, showing maybe that it was easy to sail here and it was really warm and, uh, and you could have your farms and all such things, but then there's also the Inuit coming into the fjord, the Tula culture coming in here and actually having a winter settlement here in the beginning, in the around 1260, which actually might show a shift in environments and ice margins too. Here we also have a map. This is a satellite imagery from May 2013 and actually shows, um, this is spring, how much ice there is in the fjord. 
And by looking at such things and combining the knowledge which you have from the cultures, one can think, but hmm, how did the Norse people live here? When one knows that actually the majority of what they ate were the migrating seals coming up along the coast. And such things can make, me, make one reflect over how people have moved and used the seascapes of the area, but also how the environments have been in the past. It can be settlements that are put there, that are there because of a, a, a resource that they use. Or it can be hunting and travel routes, travel routes for hunting caribou, or fox traps telling something of a distribution of uh, animals and where they would catch them. Where would the animals move? And then, of course, it's the place names that can tell a lot of things. Here we have the uh, big seagulls lake. And today there are no seagulls there. Maybe there were seagulls back in time. That it probably shows that there has been. So landscapes are filled with histories. And they're part of a social space as they infiltrate both practice, mobility, movement, and knowledge. And therefore, human nature interaction can be a really, really important proxy. They can tell something about bottom topography, how animals move, like in an area where the halibut are up north, when the narwhals come, the halibut, they move to another area because they know they'll get eaten, and they do that for a shorter period. But that area may not be mapped by natural scientists, but can be important if one is gonna have maybe a mine in that area that can do that there comes contaminants or it can be in important for mapping where how animal distributions are, but it can also be really important to, to secure food, uh, food security, that people are able to get something to eat too. But looking at this human nature interaction, one can also look at it another way, because humans and nature are actually uh, in a s inseparable. Some people's nature is some people's uh, culture. And it gives a no notion of how cultural ecosystems are seen, how cultural ecosystems have been, but also what they have provided for the humans, and how different uh, individual of humans can be different cultures, people with different values have used uh, the, the resources, how they have fished, how they have hunted. So therefore, it's important to understand and analyze human nature dynamics or interactions and how these can supplement science and knowledge production. Because knowing that different cultures live in a different way can give an indication of how they have used the animals, but also how they've moved in relation to the animals too. And then, of course, there is the stressors or impacts coming from outside, which can be climate change or innovative species that, you, that changes the way that the ecosystem is, what the ecosystem can give to the people, how they use the ecosystems and perceive their environments. It can be that some say that mm, we have stopped eating seagulls now, the chicks, because we don't like seagulls because we see them as dirty animals because they are uh, they're eating all the waste. So such things can change the values and how one perceives the different species and the use. Or it can be the markets and globalization and technology that actually can impact governance and global demand can set the frames for how individual, individual uh, people look at what we should get from nature, how we should use nature. But it also shows that people's perceptions and their relation and how they see nature can be so diverse and it's really, it's attached to one's background. But there's also another thing, and that is the people's roles in ecosystems. Because people actually can have an important role. There's been stories of hunters telling that they have always been collecting eggs from a different colony, uh, for a specific colony, and then suddenly it's banned because one wants to preserve the colony, which, it, which is okay. But then they say, but the funny thing though, is that after we stop collecting these eggs, the population has decreased. And they say, actually, we were, when we were collecting the eggs, we were actually pushing the hatching of the eggs. So not, the eggs were not hatching when the seagulls were having their chicks. But now that they're having their chicks with the seagulls and they eat the chicks. So now this is why they think that it has, there has come a decrease in amount of birds of that specific species. 
Or there are also examples from other places in the Arctic, like the Huna people in Alaska, who also have seen the same thing. It was banned, their, uh, uh, the use of uh, and hunting of seabirds. But actually, one found out that the way that they had managed and used this uh, resource was actually really, really sustainable. And it was actually, it had a big impact in how the populations kept on being healthy. So the humans actually had a really, really important role. Therefore, it's important to recognize the anthropogenic impacts and interactions with the environments and how uh, humans are part of ecosystems. Also, how they can induce top-down forcing of ecosystems or they can impact the shifts of species or being driving forces to evolution of life histories too. But also that wildlife management also uh, needs to include the understanding of people bringing it back to the social ecological systems, as I mentioned earlier, too. And being science, climate, knowledge management, and economy, as Einstein says, not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. It's therefore really important to both not only work interdisciplinary uh, and, and looking at different um, sciences, but it's also important to bring culture into the picture. Because what counts can be defined and interpreted differently depending on the culture, the epistemology, one's perceptions, and one's values, too. But how can one actually do this to be able to understand how one can gather these different ways of knowing uh, areas? Well, it can be through mapping. Because mapping is not only a navigational aid, Th they can actually be really rich social and cultural documents, as Jess Duncan says. So maps can be many things. And maps, they can actually either be physical, as, as GIS maps, as natural scientists usually use. It can be the map as Ada is holding here. But it can also be maps of a topographic memory constructed by elements and environmental clues. It can be the maps made through the place names, through no knowledge of features. It can be the maps of stories that one follows when one travels to, uh, through landscapes. But maps built on topography and uh, topographic memories and environmental clues are actually not new things. Because actually one can go back in time to around 1300 and the Portland charts. And these maps were not based on science and mathematics. They were actually catalogs of directions to follow between notable points. And these were based on local knowledge. So they were based on knowledge of wind directions, currents, geographical features, port names, observations, estimated sailing time and direction between ports. And the really incredible thing about these uh, maps was actually that they built kingdoms. They were really important for the economy of many countries, and they were built from local knowledge. But we also have other maps, like these ones, which was retrieved in relation to expedition to Amasalik in 1883. And here the people were going to sail up the coast, and they didn't know the coast, so they said, how do we know how to sail these coasts? And then the local people began you know, carving into the wood uh, how the coastline was. And it was both with, it was like a, 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 a three-dimensional map that they could follow. And that was built through their topographic knowledge. And maps can, there can be really many different maps. Like this map is a map um, showing the hunting density of the Gotthobsfjord of Caribou. Or it can be this map as Nunakis, as we know, where there's both the place names, but then there's also maps of different species where there are bird colonies, um, where you're not allowed to hunt. It can show a lot of things. And these are usually mostly natural scientific or something with biology. But apart from that, maps can also show different layers of elements. And they can actually be a really great importance in pre preserving knowledge, local traditional knowledge, but also inform and engage locals in their histories too. 
And one of these ways one can do it is by mapping. And, and here I'm going to give an example of how one can map knowledge. And this is through something called story maps. So story maps is a mapping tool which is both visual, inviting, and is fun to look at. And then the, there are different icons here. So there's icons of pictures, one could put text, one could put films, one could put data. And you can follow a path like we're going to do, or one can just have uh, points that are just, you know, there by themselves. And when one travels, of course, it gets read so one can see where are one actually moving. But why mapping and why participatory mapping? Well, participatory mapping can be a, actually an important platform to share and co-produce knowledge. It can answer environmental and uh, cultural questions. It can integrate uh, uh, generational knowledge sharing or intergenerational knowledge sharing so that knowledge is shared through generations. It can be a really good tool to preserve uh, cultural heritage. It can induce locally based approaches to management and monitoring. It can be a really important tool for education and kindle public interest too. And it can be a tool for stakeholders to know, where should I actually start looking when we're going to do this? Where is their knowledge? Where, do pe where are their cultural landscapes? Or where do people use things? Or where do I find the natural science and the publications and data? And then it can also be a really good for citizen science through websites and an app, which actually allows people to engage and upload their own observations. So people become part of the mapping process. They are part of the map. So making an example here on how one can use this map. So um, the story here begins when we were going into the fjord here. And this is Angungwag again sitting here. And it, this map is going to show that how hunters actually not only uh, call upon no knowledge which is directly linked to the traveling, but also knowledge gathered through the typonyms and the place names and knowledge of animals too and their movement. Um, and I want to note that where Angungak actually is sitting, and this was in a relation to a field trip that we did a few years ago, um, he's sitting on a Norse ruin. And when we sailed out there, it was a snowstorm. It was a snow blizzard. And around him, there's like several meters of snow around him. And he's sitting as if it's summer. And this Norse area settlement or uh, area was, um, uh, was an uh, area for summer grazing. So it really shows that people back in time have been observing and getting to know the landscapes to know where do I build the best place for summer grazing? Where does the snow sn uh, melt the fastest? And that I think is quite inspirational. But they can also tell other things. So the first time I went, really went into the fjord to do the signs, um, I went together with Christian, which is sitting, who is sitting where are you sitting? Up there. And we went to look at the Nuna Daswak area, this area here. And it was first in relation to looking at Norse settlements, but we also wanted to look at the Tula culture, how they had moved. And then we thought, hmm, okay, if I was a human, uh, which I am, how would I, um, how, what would, how would I move through the landscapes? So we thought, okay, you would probably come to the coast and move up the valleys here, and we went here. And we didn't actually find anything. And we didn't, that, that's strange. That's really, really strange. And then I met Angungwak and Mitus, who told, well, we would never go that way. There's always been a lot of ice in this fjord. And it would be too dangerous just to sail over this area here, because we could be crushed by the ice. So actually, we would sit here and wait here by Nasab Samia. And when it was not carving, uh, calling so much, we would sail over boop, and walk this way here. And then suddenly the landscapes just, you know, blew up in front of us. And we suddenly found structures, uh, hunting beds, and all of these were related to the paths of the caribou. Angungwak actually claims that it's, the, uh, it's themselves who made the paths first and then the caribou took them over. Um, but it also just shows that these knowing these things can actually help archaeological surveys and methodology in many, many different ways. So along these paths, we have found uh, hunting beds, cairns, um, 
areas for, for uh, hunting structures, meet the pots. We sh they showed us a lot of different things, but it also tells another story that these caribou, uh, booth, uh, caribou paths and hunting structures actually give an indication of how caribou have been moving through time. And in some areas, they've actually been traveling the same paths for the past 800 years, and still do. But the structures of the hunting beds and looking at lichens and found, finds as the shoulder blade up here, which is up here with the, uh, with the traces of the old drill tool effect can also give an estimate of when these areas were traveled. And many of the structures were from the Tula culture, the early Tula culture. So one could see that these actually have a, a history going far back in time. But there are also things like um, Angu are saying that the ice in the fjord has always been unstable, but the glaciers were much bigger uh, when I was young. Now, Sapsamia's terminus was much further out than today, and it has always carved a lot. And this tells a story of how temperatures have gradually raised and how open water days have become more through time, and the sea ice days have decreased. And therefore, more ice has melted, and the glaciers have uh, become thinner and retreated. So temperatures have an impact uh, on the sea and the fjord ice. But then there are also other things like this structure, and this is Kraksingwit, which is here in, on the way into Gabsilit. And this structure, uh, which is pictured here, lies really strangely up in the landscape. It lies quite high up, and, and we were thinking, why? Why is it lying there so far up in the landscape? And then we were told, ha, huh, but actually it's up here so that we can look over the fjord, so we can see when the beluga whales will travel out, or the seals, so we are prepared, so we can just jump out and hunt them. But they also tell stories, um, local hunters, of how the best hunting grounds are in fjords where the icebergs flowed or where the murky water does that the animals hear and see uh, badly. So placement of settlements in relation to hunting of whales and other marine mammals and local knowledge of animal behavior and movement can be indicators of past ice patterns, glaciers, animals living in, in a certain setting. And likewise, local knowledge can also inform archeologists, natural scientists, of why structures and settlements are placed and their social economic importance too. There are also stories of uh, knowledge which is gathered through the hunt of the, the beluga whales, which actually were here in the fjord at a, uh, at a, sp a specific time. And it's told that how they would migrate out of the fjord around in um, April, May, and how they would actually follow the coast all the way out. Or that beluga whales are really, um, 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 what's it called, sensitive to currents, and how they follow the currents and tide when traveling out of the fjord. And when you can see here, they also, one can see that um, through their knowledge, one can see that how warming maybe can affect the way that they move, how the ecosystem shifts, and also how there comes less ice in a fjord, but also indication of how oceanographic settings has been at a specific time gathering this knowledge from the, uh, the different local knowledge histories. And there can be knowledge like this. This is Samuel Kleinsmith and all the observations of ice. And you can see how all the, this is the, uh, the years, different years, and then the blue is the observations of ice. And here suddenly around 1920 they disappear. And this is a period which is actually related to a warming event which happened in, in the gut of Stuart, which changed the environment, did ecosystem shifts, and, and the settings changed drastically in relation to ice too. But then we can use other archives into the uh, fjord, like these uh, uh, photos. This is an aerial photo taken the 26th of August in 1936. And here you can actually see that the ice has just broken up when also when one collates the different pictures. And here you see also looking at a temperature curve that the temperature suddenly drops. And here it's really incredible to see that how changes can change the environment so drastically. In some, in some areas, and that's really important to note too, because that also impacts the humans and the, of course the environments in the area. 
Or looking at trade lists, here we have uh, the trade foxfurs and the trade lists of these. And you can see how uh, the foxes have been hunted here. And here we have nuke and them suddenly um, being high in numbers here. And that's also the period in the period where it becomes suddenly cold. So this can actually be an indicator of suddenly a large catch of fox furs, that it was a colder period with a longer period of ice because people will actually empty the, the fox traps in winter using um, the ice as, as a, a pathway along to the different fox traps. So actually it, it may not tell a story about a larger abundance of foxes, but actually something with um, with uh, the ice. So therefore it's important to know how people move around in the landscapes. When did they empty the fox traps and why did they do them too? So that one interprets what one sees in a correct way. But now I've been talking a lot of the past, how one can use this as echo, echo history in relation to echo, echo history and looking at uh, histories of people. How can one actually use this in the future too? How can one look forward and use methods uh, which I have applied and also use m knowledge of other regions? Uh, in this case study, which I have made, is in Article 8 about orcas. Um, and it's actually a case study on possible future scenarios of Greenlandic social economy. So actually we're moving away from the Gotthofsfjord and using some of these things, methodologies, to get an understanding of maybe future changes. So there's been different stories about killer whales uh, recently, which I jumped on. And one was one that Lena told me that she had been out hunting and, and they they caught a strange narwhal with its uh, um, tail crooked. And, and the hunters were saying that they were seeing strange narwhals. Some had their back broken and some they were taking like big lumps from their necks. And, s and the behavior of the animals were like they were scared of the, athuk, the, the killer whales that actually had increased in numbers. Or Pia from Desilak telling stories that there has come more killer whales to the East Coast. And we have begun to take advantage of this. So actually he was out on the first hunt catching these uh, killer whales. And this is actually a killer whale uh, caught uh, off the East Coast here, um, which they're transporting in. Um, yeah, and on this first hunt, they were with a VHF radio, communicating with some who had tried to hunt before. So while they were hunting, the person on the VHF was saying, what's it doing now? Well, then you should do this, and this means that now it's about to get tired, so now you have to shoot it. Or So they were getting transferred uh, knowledge through totally new technologies in a new way, which is quite interesting. But why are these observations by local hunters important of different species? Well, the observations hold important messages. And these are important also when climate and environments are changing, when ecosystems are shifting. And also in relation to the killer whales, there are few abundance estimates. So in some way can actually maybe contribute to the natural scientists. But why can this actually be a threat? Why can these be a threat? Well, first of all, they can cause top-down forcing of the ecosystems they can cause depredation. And here there's depredation. Um, this is, uh, depredation is when you have a long line, as when you catch halibut. And then the, um, the killer whales go and, you know, just p pick the, the halibut off the hook, and then they're happy and swim away. And this is a social transmitted behavior also. So this is quite important. So they teach each other how to do this. And that they can become a, a competitor, too, about the resources there, not only the fish. And it's also important in relation to food security and also the social economy of people. And other people, fishermen in other places, actually struggle with depredation, one of the things. And one of the places is both in the Crozet Islands and in Alaska, where they can eat up to 80% of what is on the long lines. So that's quite a lar large amount. But why is this important? when speaking about food security and social economy, why do we have to be in, in you know, look at future scenarios? Um, well, 
That's because fisheries, in relation to fisheries, or is that they bring economic values, that, but also social values that support a web of cultural practices. So it's not only earning the money for, of the caught halibut, it's the money that you, you get money to be able to buy the petrol for your boat, or patterns to shoot the seal, which actually is really, really important. And also in relation to these hunts, there are a lot of social interactions that are important for the different communities. So actually this animal can become a really serious competitor uh, and also threat not only the economy, but also the social economical um, elements in within a community too. And there are stories, this is not, uh, if one takes notes of stories from other regions, like here, this is actually from the 21st of uh, June, where they're talking about that they are trying to find ways to avoid the motorcycle gang. So orcas are actually uh, shaking up the Alaskan, Alaska fishing boats, it writes, because they wait until um, the fishermen have gathered the fish and then they just like collectively attack them. So they scare them away. And as Paul, he says here, we've been chased out of the Bering Sea, literally. And also, like they say, his ship, like many other boats, has electronic uh, noisemakers to ward off animals. Um, but actually, the orcas get used to them. And, they, and he says, actually, they see it as the dinner bell. Now there's food. And some also say, these animals, they know the noise of everyone's propeller. So in that way, it's important to look at it, but also how to find solutions to this too. So what does this case study actually show just here? Well, it gives an, a good example on how local knowledge can identify changes. It can give an insight on changes in ecosystems. But it also shows that knowledge from other regions is really, really important. That now that there are happening these environmental changes, that we should maybe not only look in Greenland, but look what are happening in the other countries? What are they seeing with animals coming and, and moving up north? What can we learn of their experiences? And how can we actually be, pre prepare, be prepared to be able to be there when when these changes come, and this can doesn't have to be the orcas, it can also be uh, opportunities in fisheries too. It can be a lot of different things. Yeah, it's a good possibility to be on the forefront of change if one looks and collates knowledge. So now we're about to touch base here, um, and how what has come out of this bridging cultures of knowledge and 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 my study here. Well, first of all, my study unfolded that ecological, uh, ecological and cultural entanglements in a new way. And it added a new insight and methodolo methodological inspiration into the debate on environmental and climate change. But it has also shown the importance of collating knowledge to improve the perceptions of culture and nature. And it has also demonstrated that knowledge of cultures is important in decision making. And that local knowledge and natural sciences supplement each other, giving added value to research, cultural understanding, society, not at least education, and management. And it also shows that when one uniquely, when one collates these things, actually can reveal really interesting and, and unpredictable things that these knowledges can inspire each other in many different ways. Thank you. Well, that was lots of fun, and thank you. Thank you. So <clears throat> I thought what I'd do um, now is just ask you a few questions to see about 
expanding on some of the points which um, you've made in your thesis already, um, one of them to sort of start out with is would you like to maybe expand a bit on your comments about other projects which have also used, say, map-based approaches to getting at traditional knowledge the way you have? Um, yeah, there are other um, examples. There's, of course, ALOCA, as you mm -hmm. talk about that collates different knowledge, both natural science and, and local knowledge, but also where they use the local people to do the science. Mm -hmm. So in some way, they or they get engaged, and they, it's like a top-down approach where they both get engaged, but also develop the science and what should be studied together with the scientists. There, could, there are also other um, examples, like um, in uh, British Columbia, there are different mm -hmm. projects like uh, the Hearing School or Clam Gardens. Mm -hmm. Mm, clam gardens is a project um, where you, of course, have clams and where the local people have been making uh, walls to be able to, you know, um, keep the clams in an area. And actually, they use this knowledge to be able to understand the ecosystems. And they use the traditional knowledge both to look at the ecohistory, they use the archaeology also to look at the ecohistory. Um, and then, of course, they use science also to understand how to manage these things. But the most important is that the local people, with their knowledge that they're collate, collating, actually are the managers of the area. So in that way, these are like area, er, other places that they use these things. There's also other institutions like um, the Hakai Institute, which is also in Canada. And they combine different types of knowledges. This can be archaeology, science, local and traditional knowledge, archives. Uh, and they use this for their research. And I think by this, it also really sh that that there are all these initiatives other ways, and with what I've been showing here today shows that there's really a lot of potentiality and opportunities doing this in Greenland too, because these are not only science projects; these are ways of preserving knowledge. These are way of enforcing education. So it has a lot of different and and community involvement. Mm -hmm. So they are really really important things to take into consideration. Also, that one has to look in other regions. What are they doing of work? How can we be inspired to heighten the things that we know and the research we do and the education too? And I think there's also a good argument for intercommunication between projects and regions. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not just with among the scientists, but also among the people that are the the producers of the the knowledge uh, on the ground. So. The, you know, I think that connecting across communities there could be a lot of fun. It could be really fun and interesting because mm -hmm. even though some places are far apart, some of the thoughts are the same. Like mm -hmm. perception can be the same. That's the interesting thing that one can learn from each other, both the local people and one can say, huh, I see that the same way too. And oh, you did it that way. Well, that makes me actually understand why I do this. But also with scientists and different research groups that they also work together and learn from each other and their experiences and learn also from their mistakes. So in one way, by collating all these different projects and what they have gathered and what they have learned to be able to do really good research. Great. So I think that uh, there's, there's lots of, this is part of a trend. And the nice thing is you're not alone because if you were, it would be rather sad. Uh, and in fact, you're part of this broader trend that people, I think people are now recognizing is realizing there's lots of knowledge and wisdom which isn't sitting in science departments, but it needs to be connected up to stuff that is. So I think that, again, that finding, finding ways of doing that, having these map-based approaches, having participant observation sorts of things happening, these are all the sorts of things which is in your thesis, but it's also uh, widespread, too, and a good thing. So, yeah, that's great stuff. I think it's also an interesting set of observations you made about the differences between the different local communities' relationships and resources. With the orcas, a uh, big difference between Greenland and the rest of the Circumpolar North is that Greenlanders can hunt orcas. Yeah. And most herb bales can't. So Greenlanders have the opportunity to be predators on orcas. Mm. And that's going to be a different situation. Yeah, but then there's also another thing when speaking about the orcas is also that they are high, highly contaminated too. Mm -hmm. And those are also things that one should take in consideration. Yep. And also now I mentioned the example with the seagulls that people, some people see them as, that they don't want to eat them because they see them as dirty animals mm -hmm. where before one actually used this resource. Mm -hmm. So that might also change that maybe people will not hunt the orcas because mm -hmm. they see them as uh, something not 
able to eat, but it also, it also as when you say that they're able to hunt them, when they become a competitor with the local people, mm -hmm. it might also result in that people scare them away, as, as, as one know they do, by shooting them. And that also is a bad thing, because that's things one cannot control in management mm -hmm. with the animals that are shot or uh, struck by hunters um, or other people mm -hmm. who see them as an annoyance. Mm -hmm. yeah. The orcas, of course, also get a vote. Yeah. You know, so they're also part of the learning experience, and if they're part of what they're learning is that in Greenland they can get hurt, this may change their behavior. Yeah, so probably. It's, it's some things to think about. Yeah. I mean, they're very, very bold in Iceland. They're very bold in, as you were just saying, in Alaska, um, in part because they're protected there. So yeah. it's it's safe for them. So. Yeah. Bullies of the sea. There you go. So another thing to sort of think about here is just to sort of change gears a bit. Um, we, um, we met a number of years ago in Iceland when you were participating in a project there, and I know that you've also been to field schools in Iceland. I was wondering if you might take a minute or two to reflect on the similarities and differences, your experiences working with Icelanders, your experience working with Greenlanders, and anything you'd like to say about that. Well, I can think one of the ex uh, one of the examples I can give is also in relation to one of the papers that I've made, mm -hmm. where I compare Iceland and Greenland, and 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 when I was there the last time, that was in relation to a field school. Um, it was in 2015, and and there we wasn't we were in Svartakot, which is mm -hmm. um, uh, inland in a valley, and, and it's it's a farm which really lies really remote and high up land, and actually Daniel Born he was there, and he did not understand how on earth can these people live in this area? Mm -hmm. There would be no farm, but they had actually been able to live there. And there I met a farmer, a young woman, and she began actually telling stories of, uh, of the environments. Um, and she was actually linking it. First of all, there's the place names. There were the stories of the place names, um, of how, why it was called that. Um, there were stories linked to stories she had been told by her father traveling along the landscapes. There were the stories of the sagas, Sagas are really, really good in relation to the cultural landscapes and place naming and knowledge of a feature. But she also told me something else, or it was, was that um, people usually associate uh, um, Icelanders as farmers. But actually, the reason why they had been able to live in this area was because they had actually been living f uh, w uh, using the resources that were surrounding them. So they had a lot of fish, and they had been hunting, they had been gathering eggs. So in some way, they were also hunter and gatherers. Mm -hmm. So the knowledge that she could share was really, it resembled a lot of what I had uh, gotten from when traveling with the hunters. So it was stories linked to the place names. It was uh, stories of resources or features, and some of them could be myths or places to scare one off or, you know, make it one remembered. So it was shared in the same way, and the relationships that people had with their environments was quite similar. Mm -hmm. uh, and that I thought was really, really inspiring, that you could experience in the same way too, mm -hmm. two different places. And that was also what made me want to do that paper, because I thought, mm -hmm. oh, this is really, really interesting. It's the same thing, it's just a different story because they both tell about my, when I was traveling with my father. Then we went here and he said that, and that the hunters all said, mm -hmm. when I was traveling with my father, then this and this. So it was the same story. And just this is a place where you always tell the story, so everybody always remembers it. Yeah. yeah. And that all the terrible things that live in fast-moving freshwater streams that were, will snatch children. And you can tell that story and scare your children and have them live to be reproduced. But they also give a map, you know, a map of how to travel. Yep. So it was like a map, so you c it was like I said, with the chapters in the book, so you know which way to follow. And that's also what you see in the sagas that they describe. Well, then he came to this seal lagoon and traveled there, and then he went up the island where there's a lot of ducks or, you know, so it was also a, a map on where to travel but and where to find a resource, but also to show that where one's territory is. Mm -hmm. So it was both describing the resources, but also the territory of an area. So when somebody came there, oh, oh that's the Duck Lake. I better get out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It also sort of is interesting to think about how embedded place names are with the stories, and just how much is lost if you lose place names. Yeah, it's true. There's a lot in the place names because, yeah, it tells a whole history of people not only the eco history as I've been talking about, but a cultural history and reflecting on their relationships with the areas too. Um, so I think those are elements which are really, really important to preserve mm 
-hmm. And that's also through mapping that one can do that. And the Icelanders are really also lucky that they have the sagas which are written down, which has a lot of the place names in them, um, which here in Greenland, unfortunately, we do not have in the same way. Yeah, they're not written down. So one more thing to sort of think about uh, together is, uh, you know, the use of place and tradition and knowledge and place names even for things like place-based education. So would you like to talk a little bit about how you could see the research you've been, you've been doing feeding into perhaps Greenlandic education or circumpolar education more generally? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, it's really, now we have the university here um, and it's social scientists and, and, and what they have is really, really a unique tool. They have the anthropology and they have the history, but they also have a knowledge of their culture and the environments that mm -hmm. they live in. And, in uh, and I think it would be really, really important to build on those tools they have, that how they can use, be used as a tool for natural scientists, mm -hmm. that actually they can be the workers of gathering knowledge that the scientists cannot gather. Mm -hmm. So that's also why it's really important to, I think, to gather the like Natural Institute mm -hmm. and, and um, the university, because they can actually uh, uh, you know, complement each other in many different ways. And also that it's really important to use this, this knowledge also in relation to management. And then we have people with the background and the cultural background to understand what is seen also, to put it in a cultural context that it's not ecological context. You need the cultural context too, to to mm -hmm. understand the things and to be able to manage things properly too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we were um, <coughs> in Iceland, when our teams were working uh, there, as they continue to do, um, one of the best things we did was get a whole bunch of iPads, about a dozen of them, and bring them over to the local school, which they wanted. And this was a, an effort to have the youth bother their elders to get place name information. Mm -hmm. So the youth were stalking their elders with iPads and getting records about sort of what is actually happening here. What's this place name about? What's, what's going on here? And the elders eventually <coughs> appropriated the iPads and started talking directly into them. So that was interesting and it continues to happen. So I'm sort of wondering again about sort of mobilizing this for, for school children. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to get this maybe part of a curriculum or part of at least you know, some option for place-based education. First of all, the fantastic old people sitting there, the hunters have always said that they would really want to go out and teach the youth. They want to share their knowledge. Mm -hmm. They really want to share their knowledge. And I don't think that they're the only people. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I thought it also could be done was, and now I gave the example with story maps, that mm -hmm. it can be an app. Th and then I also said that it can be an educational tool. So mm -hmm. one can have an app and gather knowledge. So it can be a way where one can engage the youth to be able to, you know, talk with the elders. What do you know about this area? What can you tell? What stories are there? And it's both that you get a connection from the old and the, uh, and the young people and also get a respect for each other um, mm -hmm. and also the knowledge, where do I actually come from? And so in that way, I thought that story maps could be a really important tool mm -hmm. for doing such things um, and also preserving these things and that the students are you know, part of the whole project. Mm -hmm. And then if one then also, um, then the hunters will tell something or the old people will tell something of an environment. Then if one puts something natural scientific into it, then they might even understand it in a, in a different way or in an easier way. Mm -hmm. So by combining the knowledge that one has from one's own environments and also what one is taught maybe in biology in school, when those are intersected, one might be able to get a broader insight of not only the biology told that, well, in Denmark we have trees and such things, but they can actually refer to what they see in their own surroundings, mm -hmm. and that's really important. It's also nice because the, the youth get a chance to show off how they can push buttons and make things work, which <laughs> everybody's yeah. into, and the elders, like us, can talk too much, which yeah. we're always big on. And but I it's fantastic when they talk. I suspect I talk too much sometimes, but okay. that's all right. It's, uh, it's <laughs> like I get paid for it, it's all all right. So before I do talk too much, I thought what I might do is ask the traditional closing question of um, assuming that you had full funding and life was good, what would you see yourself doing with your research, with what you're trying to do over the next few years? I would really want to be in, use the methodologies that they use in those projects that I have been talking mm -hmm. about, where they gather the local knowledge, traditional knowledge, archaeology, different sciences, 
and look at, like when they want to look at a, a system that is not only natural science, that one looks at, but how can these different elements, other elements, you know, supplement in knowledge? Um, that I think could be really, really interesting mm -hmm. to do because it's both a way of preserving knowledge, mm -hmm. it's a way of engaging people, it's about of kindling people's interest in both their history but also natural science. Mm -hmm. So in that way, that could be really important. And then also what I really want to do is the mapping. Mm -hmm. I would really like to map the knowledge that there is mm -hmm. in the environments and not only the local and traditional knowledge but combining the so that you have a map so you can see, well, this is what the story says, this is what the picture shows. Mm -hmm. And a film maybe of somebody showing how to build a fox trap mm -hmm. and then, you know, connecting it to natural science too, so one can see, well, we have a cable and this was a really important place where we would catch cable in um, and we would dry them there. And then you would get the biology, but why are cable in important in the ecosystem? So, you know, such things I think would be really, really interesting. And sort of map-based knowledge of delivery systems are, you know, are what everyone's he heading for now. So I think, again, this is a, something that should be really productive and I can only encourage you to go ahead and, and do this. I'm trying. Great. <laughs> okay, I think I'm done for now. Thank you. Oh, thank you.